Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corcoran here. I'm the host of this show. And for those of you who are new to this program, um, you will love this one because we've got some great, a lot of variety of different businesses and personal stories and life experiences to run through. But check out our archives also because we've got great interviews with smart CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs of companies and organizations ranging from Netflix to Kinko's, Redfin, YPO, EO, Quicken, Activation Blizzard, Lending Tree, and many more. And I'm also the co-founder of Rise25, where we help connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects. My guest here today is Travis Scott Luther. He's the founder of TrialLine.net, the SaaS-based interactive timeline software for attorneys in the legal industry. So you've listened before, you know my background as an attorney. These are for trial attorneys that are going to trial, and they're trying to explain you know, oftentimes very complex uh, timelines to a jury or to a finder of fact, a judge or something like that. And so it's not easy to do that, especially when you have long trials. So this is making it easier. And he comes from a background having a legal technology company, kind of came in as an outgrowth of that. But he started many companies along the way. We're going to hear about other ones, including a, a pillow company, cafes, skateboard shop, which he started when he was 16 years old. I don't know who's opening a retail shop when they're 16 years old and had a tough childhood as well that he emerged from. But he's also an award-winning speaker and best-selling author. His work has been featured in PBS, Forbes, and the Wall Street Journal. Of course, this episode brought to you by Rise25, where we help B2B companies to get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with done-for-you podcasts and content marketing. And you can learn more at our website, rise25.com. Uh, all right, Travis, such a pleasure to have you here today. And um, uh, first of all, let's start with your childhood because... I was a little shocked to hear that you started a business at 16 years old. I don't hear many kids who have to do that, but you had a rough childhood, poor upbringing, father who's a drug addict. Um, and so you actually had to take over uh, and raise your um, younger siblings. So take me back um, to how that all unfolded. Yeah, my <clears throat> my parents were from Los Angeles. My my mother got pregnant with me when she was 15. And by the time she was 19, she had me and my two younger brothers. Um, uh, my, my father had uh, unfortunately contracted polio as an infant. And so by the time he was, you know, nine years old, he was a, a drug addict already, unfortunately, just from the different painkillers that he was taking for the, the many, many surgeries he had to try and save his leg. And, uh, and he was never quite able to, to get away from that. And, and he had a bit of a temper. Um, he, he could be very unpredictable as well as very loving, but also very unpredictable. And my mother, uh, when she was 20 years old, decided it was probably a better idea for us to leave California. And so she fled uh, uh, him, and, uh, him and went to rural Washington. So we left uh, uh, Los Angeles for a town in Washington state called Steptoe, which had a population of about 13 people. Um, I often say four of which were my family. So it was <laughs> it was a big change. Um you know, and from there, my mom worked really hard to, to you know, try and put her life back together. And <clears throat> but it was a hard road. And and um, you know, we 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 did have you know, we tried to have things work out with my father, and and then they wouldn't. And my mom just you know, she was a child when she when she had us, and so she was really trying to figure out things for herself as it went. And and unfortunately, it didn't go as as good as it, it goes for other people. And so yeah, by the time I was. Um, 15, we had been bounced around from a lot of relatives' house, foster care, friends, neighbors, uh, things of that nature. And so um, two weeks before my 16th birthday, I just kind of, after, you know, being sent off to another relative's house and then being sent out of there, I said, you know what, I, I am going to just kind of break out of this cycle of of being sent around and just start my own life. And and so that's what I did. Um, and by the time I was uh, 16, I had uh, finally found my own place after, uh, you know, uh, maybe, you know, close to a year of 
of homelessness and, and taking advantage of offers from friends. And, and then at that point, um, took uh, at 16 years old, were you ever, were you sleeping in a car or sleeping on the streets? Were you still sheds. in Washington state? Yes. Wow. I was, I would sleep, sleep storage sheds. I'd slept wow. uh, in church balconies. Um, wow. uh, a lot of, with a lot of couches with friends. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, and then I lied about my age and got a job, a full-time job at a hotel, cleaning hotel rooms, mm. um, and started taking advantage of some of those empty rooms <laughs> and sleeping in those empty How did rooms. you not get caught? Well, I did get caught. You got caught. I did get caught. And the, and, uh, the manager of the hotel and her daughter, they lived on, on the premises, as a lot of those hotel owners did. And I, I kind of just came clean with her and explained my situation. And uh, she was wonderful. She set me up with a room. Wow. And uh, said said you can just stay here and work here until you can get uh, get on your feet. And so uh, shortly after that, I was able to uh, find a mobile home, a trailer in a trailer park, and uh, got that. And then my brothers came and lived with me from there. So yeah, so I, I you so know, you're was, 16 years old, and that, and then all of a sudden you have two other mouths to feed. How old were your siblings at the time? They would have been uh, about 13 and 14. Wow, wow. Yeah. And so we, I know you had to drop out of school. Were, were they continuing to go to school? You're continuing to like <laughs> make them lunches, bring them to school, all that kind of respons- adult responsibility? No, no, you know, when they came to live with me, they had come out of foster care, been asked to leave foster care. Some I, I can't remember exactly what the circumstances were, but by this point they were they were also doing things like alternative school or, you know, just not traditional school. Mm-hmm. And um they were just never able to get back into a rhythm to go back to school. So mm-hmm. I, you know, as much as I wish I could say that I, I raised them well and did a good job, uh, it was more a survival for all three of us. And so, you know, none of us ended up graduating from high school, though. How did you end up working, though? Were they on their own? I just, how, how was I able to get jobs? Hey, how did, well, how, I, how did you, uh, how were you able to go off and work? I guess they're 13, 14 years old, so they're kind of independent by that age. Yeah, I mean, they probably shouldn't have been, but you yeah. know, I, I just lied. I, to be honest with you, I would just tell people I was eighteen or I just turned mm-hmm. eighteen, you know, and, mm-hmm. and no one really asked. Um, I think there's a little bit too of you know living in a in a fairly small town where people kind of knew me and my family history, and I think they mm-hmm. kind of knew I was taking care of my family, and so there were some things I was able to, some cracks I was able to slip through that maybe other people wouldn't yeah. have been able to, you know, I think that the the police in general had a good idea of what was going on and that I was taking care of my brothers. And so I got treated with a little more respect and a, a lot fewer questions than maybe other 16 or 17 year olds in my position. So, Yeah. Now, um, given all you've been through, you would be, you could easily be excused for being angry and upset about the rough hand that you were dealt. And yet you seem from all, the way that I know you pretty even keeled Mm-hmm. Um, I might be jumping ahead in the story here to talk about that, but is that something that you've worked on? Is that something intentional or did you, did you come out that way or, or, you know, is that a product of, you know, having observed the way your father was and made it a, a deliberate, intentional decision to, to be a different way? I definitely made an intentional, deliberate decision, but I was also the oldest one in my family and kind of always the caretaker. So, I, you know, from a very young age, I'd always haven't had to be taking care of stuff, right? Taking care of the family, taking care of my own money situation, getting people fed, getting people moved around, making sure people were happy, you know, making sure my dad was alive sometimes, you know. And so there was, my mom always said I was always acting 40 from the time I was four. She said, I just always seemed to be somebody who was taking care of me. And I asked her later years, you know, um, you know, talking about, you know, why why didn't you help more? Give me a little more assistance. And she said, oh, I'm, you know, she said very honestly, I'm very sorry. I just didn't realize that you would ever needed that because you always seem to have you know, your life together, uh, you know, in, in, in the face of everything else that you were going through that she always I kind of looked at me as the strong one and never really thought I was mm. suffering or needed any help. So it's a, a not an uncommon thing for children of addicts that they end up becoming very responsible because they have to from a young right. age. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I, I think I certainly have had periods and bouts of a lot of anger. I think uh, certainly when I was younger, um, you know, when you're in your twenties, you don't see things the way you do as when you're in your forties, like I do now. And now I have the benefit and, and I will say I have a great relationship with my mom. Um, 
but now I have the benefit of being able to look back and say, you know, what's a 15 year old supposed to do, right? <laughs> like, like uh, my mom got married, I think two or three weeks after her 16th birthday, uh, had a lot of mental health issues in her own family and, and, and then it married a, an alcoholic and a drug addict who had a, who could be pretty violent. Um, I don't, I don't know that I would have been able to do much different. So at the older I get that the, the more empathy I have towards decisions that both of my parents made, mm -hmm. because when you look at it, you don't see a lot of choice there. Right. And, it, and then I, unfortunately is this poverty is this kind of recursive thing where every generation seems to have few choices as well, but I've had a chance to be able to kind of step outside of that and understand my place in the world and then make better decisions to get me to where I want to go. And I think that's kind of the, the difference between me and some other people, especially my younger brothers, unfortunately, who, we're always just kind of being led, right? Always kind of just being told where they were going to live next or where they were going to go next and didn't never got a chance to do something on their own or make something of themselves. Mm -hmm. They definitely acted out a lot more than I did. Um, we've all struggled, myself included. I don't make any secret about this, but with addiction issues ourselves, but my brothers uh, never those ruin their lives, like really ruin their lives and never, um, they never got to thrive because by the time they were in positions to be on their own, they had felonies, they had been in prison. Um, mm. they didn't look like very nice people, <laughs> even mm. though they could be, but by the time they were 18, you know, they had, they had been through the system and they had records and they had debts and they didn't have driver's licenses and stuff. And, and they just were not ever in a position to thrive. Um, I avoided a lot of that myself. Um, and so I was able to open some doors for myself that, uh, that they just weren't. What were some ways, you know, we, you and I know each other through EO entrepreneurs organization, um, which a big component of that organization is, um, you know, focusing on self-improvement. And I, I'd say that's a common value for the entrepreneurs who join that is they, they want to improve themselves. They want to work on themselves in different ways, uh, personally and professionally, but what are some ways other than EO that you have really worked on intentionally um, up-leveling your skills, in increasing your understanding of finances and and um, business and, and things like that? Um, I'll point out one of them was, even though you had to drop out of college, you actually ended up going going back and, get, sorry, dropping out of high school, getting going back, getting your GAD, and and actually going back and graduating from college, I believe. Yeah, I did. And then after that, I went off to graduate school. And then after wow. that, I uh, I ended up becoming a professor uh, in entrepreneurship for about four years. So I had a kind of a full circle of education. Wow. Um, but, you know, going to college um, was a real powerful experience for me in the sense that I found the subject of sociology. And, you know, sociology looks at the structures that kind of come down on people and how they keep people in different stratified places or keep them in poverty or keep them rich or give them opportunities or eliminate opportunities. And I would say that when I went back to college in my undergrad, um, I took I took an intro to sociology class just to get finished. Right. And so mm -hmm. when I took it and I, I started to see myself in all these studies and I started to see myself under the stresses of all these all these, uh, uh, you know, all this social stratification, I started to understand why I ended up the way I did. Uh, that was a big eye opener for me. And, 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 it, and what's funny is I just went to school because I was at a point where I kind of thought I was a loser. I kind of thought I didn't have what it took to be an entrepreneur because I had had so many failures up until that point that I thought maybe, maybe the, the naysayers who say, Travis, you're really bright. Maybe you should just go to school and try and get a job like everyone else. I started to think that maybe they're right. Um, so that's why I went back to school. But then mm -hmm. once I got into that subject matter, I, I just like, I, I realized that, that I had so much power to learn on my own too, even outside of school, you know, up until that point, I had read one book almost in my entire life, which I think was mm -hmm. the karate kid. Um, I thought I, I thought <laughs> a it was, book? <laughs> I know. there's a book version of it. <laughs> there is a book version. Um, and I thought I was stupid and I thought I was a dumb learner. And what I it come to realize and what I keep telling my kids the, these days is um, it's just, I had never, I had never studied anything that I was per personally interested in. And once I found some subjects that I was personally interested in, I just, I just became 
just hungry for education. Mm-hmm. And I, so it was kind of that accidental turning point, that almost defeatism, if you will, of conceding that, yeah, maybe I don't have what it takes to be an entrepreneur and maybe I should go back to college that um, really kind of shifted the way that I was starting to look at the world and look at the possibilities for myself. So interesting that it took going back to college to yeah. inspire that love of learning outside of the classroom. That's right. Yeah. Um, so let's let's jump backwards to so 16. You have to leave the home. You have to get, you know, uh, drop out of school. You get housing. You take over your two younger siblings. And then you start a skateboard and snowboard shop, which you open with a friend. Mm -hmm. Um, And it it, it didn't go so well. So talk about that. Yeah, I think I think at that time I was I was still working for the hotel and um, I had met a guy. Uh, right before that job, who got a job at the hotel as well. And he was kind of in a similar situation. In fact, he had the storage shed that we were that we were living in. His parents were going through some stuff, but he was a little bit older than me. Um, uh, but he his mom really wanted him to go to college. And when she was younger, she bought him a whole bunch of um savings bonds, I guess, which was kind of a kind of a thing back then. Yeah, yeah. And um, so he didn't want to go to school. I think he had something like six thousand dollars of these savings bonds and his mom told him well if you don't want to go to school i'll give them to you for something else like starting a business but i'm not just going to give them to you to spend and he told me that and i said well let's try and figure something out if you've got the money and you know i i I was a big skateboarder back then um and we we both hung out at this coffee shop that had a space available for it upstairs i'm sorry a retail space available upstairs i said why don't we just try and open like a skateboard shop or something and and so we kind of looked at our is, is this by the way still in your town of 13 people <laughs> no 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 by this time we had moved to pullman washington which okay. is about twenty thousand people all right, all right, okay okay most of those people are college students and that's why we thought this was such a good idea um yeah so we rented the space and we, we we bought some new merchandise we didn't have very much stuff in there and then it's kind of funny the store opened and people would kind of wander in and say oh, would you like to add this product or this product? And then give us these order sheets. And I'd say, yeah, I'd love to order that stuff, but I don't have any money. And they said, oh, you can do it on terms. You know, you can order $5,000 worth of shirts and sweatshirts and you can pay it back in 60 days. And I thought, oh, this is great. Then we can just get it. And when we get the money for it, we'll pay it back. And then some of the kids, the college kids wandered in and wanted to, wanted to try and sell their stuff. And so we we kind of, we never intended to do consignment, but then consignment be- became a part of our business as well. So we had a lot of used skis and snowboards in there on consignment. Um, but yeah, about six months into that, I, I went in there one morning over the students' Christmas break, which we, we closed over all of the college holidays because no one was in town. But yeah, I walked in and almost everything was gone. All the skis and snowboards were gone um, and some of the clothing. And so I drove right down to my partner's house and I said, please tell me you've got, you took our stuff out of the store, you know, over the holiday. Uh, uh, and he said, no. And it turned out that somebody had, had punched a hole in the top of the wall, climbed over and then taken everything out the back door. Uh, so uh, it was tough. I didn't, I just didn't know what to do um, mm. as the, as the, I put a note on the door basically saying, this is how to contact me. And as the students returned, uh, from winter break, those kids who had consignment things on there started calling me and I started explaining the situation. And unfortunately, well, I don't say unfortunately, but yeah, as you would expect, a number of them started to sue me. The clothing mm-hmm. companies that ha- had stuff in their own credit st- sued me for those invoices. And so, uh, yeah, by the time I was 17, I think my total bill was somewhere in the neighborhood of $14,000. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to court. I didn't tell the judge or anything that I was a minor. I just just took it. And then uh, shortly after that, I got a job at a grocery store. And about two weeks after that, they came and told me they got uh, noticed with a uh, hold my wages. wages. For that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you have to uh, file for bankruptcy? No. And to be honest with you, I would not even have known what that was. So I just so you didn't even know. Uh, I didn't even know. I just I just continued to work. They continued to take the money out and so eventually took the money out of the garnishment. Off. Oh yep. man. Yep. Oh, that's the worst. <laughs> I'm like former attorney here. Right. I'm like, I'm like, Oh, I hope he declared bankruptcy here. <laughs> Cause like, <laughs> that's not his fault. And you no insurance of course, or anything no like insurance. that. Yeah. Oh man. Oh. So, um, this is, these aren't the only co- businesses you had. So you also during college, you had some cafes as well. So we'll point you, you, you work at a hotel, work at a grocery store. Um, Ski, ski and skateboard shop didn't work out that well. When did you start some cafes? 
So the building that our skateboard and snowboard shop was in was a was a um, a building called the Combine Mall, and the Combine Mall had a few re- retail places in it, but it was um, mostly a bakery and coffee shop called the Combine, and it uh, served all the students. Students would come down there and eat and study, and they had concerts upstairs, and so it was a real social hangout and and, and pretty much like the go to place in town. The woman who owned it um, decided to leave and move to San Francisco to be with her children, and she. She didn't want to sell it or anything. She just wanted to get out of town. So we were suddenly left with this void of no no place to hang out, no place to have bands, no place to have art shows. And so I went to that same guy. And by this time, I had had uh, I had bought my own mobile home. And so I had something I thought I could borrow against. And I said, we should open up a coffee shop. Same guy you know, uh, had the uh, at the skateboard shop. shop. Okay, because yeah, I knew he still had three thousand dollars of those bonds left. <laughs> but. This this was probably three three or four years after that. So, um, but we we still remained really good friends, and and so he he's like, all right, let's let's figure it out. So we figured it out. We we got another partner, another friend of ours, um, yeah, and we opened a place right across the street from that called Java Llamas. Um, we didn't have real uh, reasonable expectations about what three. Uh, men could live off of in a college town off of a a little coffee shop. And I think pretty soon we realized it wasn't enough for all of us. And so my partners eventually phased out and I took uh, sole ownership of the coffee shop Um, and it was doing okay. And then one day a guy walked in and he said, uh, Hey, I own this drive-through place called Pony Espresso a couple blocks away. I I had known it. It had been around for many, many years, but he said, I want to leave town. I'm going to go get into the frozen yogurt business. And this is back in the nineties when frozen yogurt was becoming a big, Oh yeah. I was like, Oh, this is a never ending, a rocket ship. Yeah. Yeah. It was like (laughs) TCBY or something. He wanted to go open chains of that. So he he kind of made me an offer. He said, "What would you pay for the business and the building, and how much could you pay a month?" And and uh, it was almost like he walked in, and I I don't remember what the figure was. I think it was like, "Well, I said I could afford four hundred dollars a month," and he said, "Okay, deal." And he handed me the keys, and so suddenly I now had this this okay. pretty pretty large coffee shop down on Main Street, um, and then I had this drive through place a couple a uh, couple blocks away. I thought things were really going to turn around. And even though the Java Llamas, the main store was struggling a little bit, it was coming up. And I figured that having the second place might give me the cash flow I needed to really, really thrive. A couple of weeks after that, the city manager walked into my store downtown and he said, oh, great news. This this bill that we had up to, to uh, widen Main Street and the sidewalks and put all these bike things in is passed. And so we're going to get to work on that. We're shutting down Main Street. All your oh. customers now have to come in through the alley. Oh, no. I was like, what are you talking about? And long story short, that killed me. I had no business oh. at my main store. I now had this second store that you know I had debt on and was not very busy. I, I suddenly realized why the guy wanted to get out of town. Mm-hmm. And after, I don't know, three or four months of that, I kind of threw my hands up. I called a woman who owned some other drive throughs who had also told me at one point, she said, I'd love to have a place like yours, but I would never want to compete with you. I thought that was real nice of her. Um, so I called her and I said, told her the situation. I basically turned over the keys uh, to kind of get out of my debts at the time. And, um, you know, proudly the place is still there, you know, 20, 20, 30 years later, it's still sitting there, still yeah. operating. So that's kind of cool. But, but that yeah. is the kiss of death for a place that requires on foot traffic, you know, uh, when there's some kind of, construction like that I, there's so many times i've passed by a retail place and you see something else like a sidewalk being rebuilt or something and just yeah. you feel for that business owner yeah 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 it, w- it was all of us down there it was just i was kind of a young inexperienced kid who didn't have a bank account to get through it so right um so you, you got a number of other businesses here so valet ads what was valet ads so i you know i told you that story about moving mo- moving to denver to go back to college because i felt like i was a shitty sh- sorry can we I was a poor That's entrepreneur yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and that maybe I should just go to college. And so I, I came here, I started school and at night I worked as a valet parking cars in the, in our fancy uh, Cherry Creek restaurant district, which is kind of where all of our affluent people are. Um, and I'm passing out these big valet tickets. And, and at some point I get this idea, like, you know, I should put advertising on these tickets and I can reach all these people with money. And so I talked to the owner of the valet company. I said, Hey, would you let me go? try and sell advertising on these valet tickets. And he said, 
yeah, you can try, but it's like, it's never going to work. And I said, okay, if it's never going to work, would you mind if I also tried it to get this deal with all the other valet companies in town too, so that I could give out more tickets? <laughs> nice. I said, yeah, go do whatever you want. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and it's okay if I retain 100% of the profits. Absolutely. That, that was yeah. my deal. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you free tickets, right? This is my deal. Oh, uh, okay. Free tickets. Free valet yeah. tickets. Yeah. And I'll pay you one penny per ticket to use them. Mm. And he said, go for it. He said, it'll be too expensive to print. It'll never work. So I, I go and I make a deal with all the other valet companies in town. And then I just put together kind of like a flyer and I start mailing it to, you know, luxury home builders, condos and car dealerships. And within two weeks, I had a, a deal with Mercedes Benz. Um, and once that ticket started going out, other advertisers saw it and was like, wow, this is a cool idea. And they would just reach out to me. And did you have so, like a promotion on the ticket? Like on the back of it, I just it just said, you know, advertise here, call okay. myself. Not like twenty percent, not like twenty percent off your S class or anything. Like no, that. no. Oh, okay. the, the front of the ticket would be like a lease deal. It would say like, "Hey, okay. come to Steve's, yeah. you know, get an S class five hundred for five hundred a month or something." Okay, like yeah, that. yeah. But yeah, so you know, I, I tell the story that the year before I had moved there, I'd file a tax return for nine thousand uh, dollars mm -hmm. for the entire year for working full time, basically minimum wage the entire year, and 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 within within two three months of of getting this idea, I was making commissions of at least fifteen thousand dollars a piece, like just in my own pocket. So it was mm -hmm. a huge shift for me. But mm -hmm. what I realized with the ballet ads company is I started to understand all these lessons I'd learned from what I perceived as these failures in the past, right? I started to understand, oh, I need to know what my cost of goods are. Mm. Oh, I need to know what my who my customers are going to be. I need to know what what uh, my capacity is going to be. And I, I just, it was, it was really interesting because everything just started to come together. And so I got excited about you know, doing that nationally. So I built a website and then I got really interested in SEO and web design and marketing uh, mm -hmm. online for my Valet Ads company. And that was successful too. I, I ended up doing deals all over the country, but I met a lawyer at that time and uh, started dating her, my, who's now my wife, Summer, but she saw that I had this knack for technology and for uh, design. And she said, Hey, these lawyers are always asking for people to build them a website or do a brochure for them or to plug in a TV for a trial they have. Would you be interested in working with them? And I said, yeah, sure. Send me the referrals and I'll talk to them. Well, within like six months, my referrals from her far exceeded what I was even doing in the valet ads. And mm. so I look at the guy who was working for me and I said, Let's just make a fake company. We'll call it Law Father because I love the Godfather movie. So we'll call it Law Father. And we'll just say all we do is we just work technology for lawyers. And he said, okay. So I did that. And, and like I said, within six months, I was I had a bigger business than anything I had had before. Um, wow. By this time, I had actually started a PhD program. Um, I had backed out of that because I was too busy. <laughs> I had all these employees in my in my basement. And, uh, you know, that's, that's when I came to EO. Um, and yeah, I mean, you was... have just beat all the odds. I'm sure I'm not the first person telling you that, but, you know, to, to get into EO, the, I think the statistics are that less than 1% of businesses, uh, reach that level, but with your background and uh, upbringing, I mean, it's truly remarkable what you've achieved and, um, was that meaningful for you when you, you know, kind of hit these different milestones, like being able to, you know, join EO? For sure. Yeah. The the statistic is actually 4%. So only four, the, the only 4% of all businesses started will eventually reach a million dollars in annual revenue. And so I was actually prospecting and I met a lawyer named David McLean. Maybe this would be going under my gratitude because he remains a good friend. Now I was trying to sell David McLean web services. And he was the first person to ever like say, well, sit down, Travis. And so I sat down with him and, I, and I'm going over all this marketing stuff and all the things we can do for him. And he just starts asking me questions about myself. Then he asked me about my business. He asked how my business is going. He asked me, what would I do differently? Where could I use help? And I thought, God, this is interesting, <laughs> you know, that a prospect that's having such a deep conversation with me. And I saw a copy of Atlas Shrugged sitting on the desk behind him. And um, at that time, that Atlas Shrugged movie had just come out, you know, I guess this was like 10, 12 years ago. And I said, oh, I, I see you like Atlas Shrugged. Maybe we could go check out that movie when it comes out. And he said, he said, yeah, that'd be cool. Why don't we also go get a cigar? He was a big cigar smoker. And I said, all right. So we went and had a cigar. And he he said, I 
you know, he was asking me more deeper stuff about my business challenges. And he, think, he said, I think I know this organization that that you might really benefit from or will be interesting to you. And he gave me a ticket to a to what would become an EO Colorado event that was open to the public. I went there. And I just like I just fell in love with the people I was meeting, with the speakers. I really felt like I had found a home. It was pretty incredible. The the caveat was I said, okay, I want to join. Well, you have to have a business that's a million dollars or more. And I didn't. And at that point, Law Father was only at $240,000 in revenue. So somebody told me, well, you know, they have an accelerator program for businesses from 250000 to a million dollars. So if you can get to 250000 you could join Accelerator. So I begged and pleaded and to, to whoever I needed to, and they agreed to actually let me in at two hundred and forty thousand dollars, <laughs> and it was awesome. I went through that accelerator program, and within three years, I got in Law Father up to a million dollars. And then, mm. you know, um, based uh, you talked a little bit about my pillow business, but based on the things that I had learned there, um, when I launched my pillow business, that was actually able to get that to a million yeah, dollars we- within eighteen months, just from. Mm-hmm. Just from what uh, I learned from you, amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. So we we were talking about that before the interview. Yeah. So Queen Anne Pillow Company was the name yeah. of it, and you started it because you had some back problems, and so you kind of went down this rabbit hole of seeing if there were other pillow companies out there that um, that could help with the back problem. Um, so talk a little bit about the origins of that. Yeah, I mean, like Law Father was a side project of valet ads. Uh, Queen Anne Pillow had to kind of become a side project of Law Father. I was sitting at my desk a lot. And when I wasn't sitting at my desk at Law Father, I was crawling around courtrooms, installing cable and different audio video gear. And um, just, just you know, I had a real tired body. And so by the mm-hmm. time I was, you know, 30 seven, I think I had had two back surgeries and and was just really uncomfortable and miserable. I saw a bunch of ads on TV for pillows that claim to solve your neck pain. And so I asked myself, I wonder if there's a pillow out there that can help with back pain. Um, I couldn't find anything. Not only could I not find anything, but I realized that when you shop for a pillow online, you know, the prices range from $5 to $500. And it was impossible to understand what the difference between any pillow was. Um, so I reached out to a pillow manufacturer who just, just did commercial stuff. They did like hotels and hospitals. And I said, I, I kind of want to make some of my own pillows for myself. Would you mind teaching me a little bit? Send me boxes of fill and and let me fool around with it. So they would. They send me boxes of like down, down and feather, polyester, latex, all sorts of stuff. I would stuff it in these in these tickings, which is what all the pillow fill goes in. I'd send it back to them. They'd sew it up, clean it up, send me back a box of pillows and I'd work on them and adjust them. And I finally got a set of pillows I liked, but I thought, gosh, I wonder if other people are having the same problem of not understanding how to buy pillows, period, whether it's for your back, your neck or anything else. So I got online, uh, did a search of um, pillow searches and saw that there was something like 25 million uh, different searches a month of these same various questions that I was asking about the pillow buying experience. And I would say much like uh, Tony Hesh from Zappos, a lot of people told me, you know, starting an online pillow business isn't going to be very successful because nobody's going to want to buy a pillow that they can't actually touch or feel. And so part of my strategy was was to make an app that would give you recommendations of pillows based on answering 12 questions about your sleep. And if those pillows did not uh, do what we said they would do, then we would keep replacing them until a set did. Mm. And so about 90% of the people who bought our pillows were, um, were satisfied from from uh, what they got from the answers from that app. And then the other 10%, we would just adjust them and sell them. So you could literally send us your pillow and we would either take fill out or put fill in, send it back to you. If that worked, great. If not, you could send it back and we would try it again. It's kind of a scary proposition for a, especially a new business because, you know, it goes through your head like, oh, what if we have nightmare customers who keep sending pillows back to us? Mm-hmm. Did that, do you experience that at all? We had a few nightmare customers who kept sending pillows back and they were the minority. Mm. And we learned a lot from them, you know. Um, uh, but no, most, like I said, that the, the recommendation system worked really well. We took information from sleep studies as well as other reviews of pillows. And diff- we actually looked at mostly one and two, three-star reviews to tr- try and figure out what we could do to correct problems in pillows that seemed to be consistent. And so that seemed to be a really good strategy was kind of solving problems before they became problems based on problems other pillow companies were having. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, how did you 
get what are the secrets behind getting to a million bucks and with a brand new product in a new industry you haven't sold in before in 18 months looking back on it now what would you say were the reasons you were able to get to such high revenues um definitely amazon for us because we could we could enter and i was very hesitant to to go into amazon because our pillows were really pretty expensive. They range from 700 to, I'm sorry, from $70 to $300. And at that time, I largely looked at Amazon as a place where you buy, you know, phone chargers and USB chargers and things like that. I didn't really look at it as a place where you might have luxury or semi-luxury goods. Um, but what, what I realized is that, you know, I had a search engine optimization background or SEO background from some of the marketing work that I was doing in the Valley Ads company. And that had transferred over to my um, legal technology company where part of what we did is build websites for lawyers and search engine optimize them. And I came to understand that the a Amazon environment was just basically like that, right? Like if you could understand keywords and search history and, and the questions that people ask to search, you could start to retool all of your content and your graphics around those problems that were people were having and, and then start to be really successful. So it was, almost, it was almost like a natural extension from a lot of what I was doing already. Um, and, and then they started offering paid ads. And, and so I was able, again, to take the knowledge I kind of had from the Google ads environment, apply that to the Amazon environment and continue to be you know, a successful yeah. online seller. I want to, um, Sorry, oh, I was just going to say, as you, you know, as a business ages, then those repeat customers and referrals start to become really important. And so, you know, going back to, was it upsetting to have to redo pillows for people a lot? You know, it never was, it, it, it was always worth it because those people were ecstatic, right? And so those mm -hmm. were the people who maybe had three pillows adjusted, who would tell all of their friends, mm -hmm. you got to go with this company, they're so great. And then so repeat customers and referrals started to become a big part of our business after that. So one of the things that seems to have happened repeatedly in your career is another a, a secondary business or a new business has come out of a previous business. Mm -hmm. But I know from my own personal experience, you know, having gone from practicing law to, um, you know, an event based business uh, with some online marketing business in, in between and, and now helping uh, B2B companies to start podcasts and content marketing that there's always a tension between you know, the time and energy and attention and resources you put into a new business versus the old business. And you can get into a lot of trouble uh, if you put too much into something before you've established product market fit and it's taken off. So what are some guidelines that you have in retrospect for others listening to this who may feel the same way? They want to put more energy and time and attention into something else compared to what they're currently um, using. Well, a lot of my later success came from what I had to learn from my earlier failures. And, and the big thing that I learned is that your, your business will be way more successful much faster if the focus of that business is solving problems. So when I started my earlier businesses, like, you know, my coffee shop and and uh, my skateboard shop and and some other things that I did that we hadn't talked about. The truth is, is nobody had ever asked me to do those. And they weren't really like solving a problem, right? They were mm -hmm. passion projects in the in the sense that I, I believed a lot of what people say about if you follow your passion, you never work a day in your life, blah, blah, blah. So I wanted to be involved in like social things, skateboarding things and music things. But I was never solving a problem. I was just trying to follow my passions. After those failures, I started to think I was a bad entrepreneur. But if you look at all of my businesses since then, they're all about solving problems. You know, how do you reach the educated and affluent, right? How do you put an yeah. ad and, you know, what's the best way to sell a car lease on a Mercedes Benz? Well, put it, put an offer right in the hand of somebody who's parking one, right? Or a competitor's um, with, uh, with, uh, law father, you know, the problem was there was no companies dedicated to the needs of lawyers, uh, the, the technology needs of lawyers. So if a lawyer had a, a problem, they had to reach out to Best Buy. Well, Best Buy doesn't know how to help you put something together for the courtroom or, you know, yeah. things like that. So as I got more targeted and more niche, you know, get rich in your niche, as they say, and solved really specific problems, my business success uh, just kind of seemed to happen a lot easier and a lot faster. So mm -hmm. with the pillow company, it was a matter of people are struggling to understand what kind of pillows to buy. I, you know, I, I'd give some talks at all these things. I'd say, raise your hand if you're unhappy with your pillows. And, you know, 80% of the people raise their hand. Almost everyone complains about their pillows all the time. So there's a problem there. The problem is how do you teach people? you know, people to make better pillow buying uh, decisions for themselves. So they're more comfortable. Right. And, and so there, 
I was never passionate about pillows. I was passionate about my back pain and solving that problem. I was never passionate about the law or technology, but I, but I, no one else was serving them. That was a big problem. Then as we move on to trial line, it's, it's a very similar story. I don't have any. Yeah. And, and that's a natural outgrowth of law father. So yeah. um, you saw attorneys in the courtroom that were struggling to explain a complex timeline with many different things that happened along the way. And you saw a path forward with a solution. So talk about trial line. Yeah. So as part of the law for other business, like I said, we rent audio video equipment, install it in courtrooms or, or take it in there temporarily for trials. <clears throat> and um, and we would also consult with attorneys on how to make digital presentations and demonstratives. So we might do animations for them around the mechanism of injury or defect on a product or something like that to try and show the jury. But timelines were always central to that legal explanation or that process. And so we would do some graphic design timelines, if your listeners are familiar with like Photoshop or Illustrator. From time to time, we might make a, a graphic timeline, uh, blow that up on a poster board and then put it up there. But the, the problem is if you come into court Monday morning or Friday night, and you have some new information or as the testimony is going on during the trial, you want to add stuff to yeah. that timeline. There's no way to do it. You know, there's no dynamic way to take the poster board <laughs> put a new you know event on it and then put it back up there. And so I was thinking gosh there's there's got to be a timeline tool out there that we can find for our lawyers so we can have kind of a more on the fly uh easier interactive timeline software and I looked and looked and looked and there wasn't anything. I did find something called Time Map um but it just looked terrible and and truth be told the sales rep never got back to me in time to for this project I was working on so since yeah, I'm going to just gonna launch a business yeah so well <laughs> That's I had one this, slow sales rep <laughs> no really I really yeah. it's funny because after I so I walk over to my my little coding department and I say hey guys this is my idea for for a quick timeline thing that we can give to our clients so that they can build some pretty simple timelines by the time they were done with a little test version and I had showed it to my wife who's a lawyer uh then finally, I got a call back from their sales rep. This must have been four or five months later. He said, oh, I see that you've reached out to us about our software. You're like, I like this competition. <laughs> that's what I say. Yeah. I mean, that's really it. I said, thank God for them because, you know, for, for not their slow response and, and kind of ineptitude, yeah. maybe I would not have grown as quickly or as fast as I did. But so anyway, from and You that, actually have on your Lawfather website, you say... Um, if we hundred dollar guarantee, if we don't return your phone call within twenty four hours, we'll pay you a hundred dollars. So that's right. Speed of response is something that you clearly prioritize in your businesses. Yeah, because I think in legal, in legal and legal tech, and you know this, right? You you just have these mammoth companies. You have Westlaw, you have LexisNexis, uh, you have Fine Law, and and they're kind of the only game in town. And so if you're a lawyer who comes up against a technical challenge in your software, or your doc review software, or something like that. It could be forever until someone responds to you, you know, and you just have to accept that. And um, part of my quick success in the early days of Law Father was people are like, oh, you called me right back. Oh, you fixed, you added that new page of content the next day. Oh, you fixed my address right away. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it, it just became obvious to me that if if we can promise people to be there for them, then we're going to get a lot of business just on that customer service alone. And that was that was pretty good intuition. Yeah. What are you most excited about as we, I, I, I'm mindful of the clock and um, we'll wrap things up, but um, with trial line or any other businesses, what are you most excited about as you look to the future, to the new year? Um, I'm, I'm most excited about SaaS becoming commonplace in legal. You know, trial line is a SaaS based interactive timeline tool. And 15 years ago, when I was selling websites and online marketing to attorneys or just digital presentations in general, I had to convince a lot of attorneys that they even needed a website or convince a lot of attorneys that they needed to digitize their exhibits, right? Because it was kind of the old guard, you know, and I don't disparage baby boomers, but it was mostly baby boomers. I think all uh, uh, entrepreneurs should be excited about the fact that, you know, millennials now are the fastest growing cohort of entrepreneurs and that a lot of the things that you and I kind of worked hard to make commonplace in technology are already commonplace to new entrepreneurs. And so 
selling the technical divide is no longer a challenge. There's not fear around having a web-based application as part of your software suite. And so to me, that's that's really exciting because because then that makes all the ideas a lot easier to code and test and set up. And I think it just makes it a lot uh, uh, less risky for new entrepreneurs to try something um, and, and, you know, and deliver an MVP without having to to hire a development shop and, and, and get really expensive on desktop applications. Um, I'm curious um, with your background, with your rough upbringing, um, your father now, how do you, how have you approached fatherhood um, and raising your kids, uh, you know, given the way that you were raised? Mm. My number one thing and uh, the experience I share with other parents who have been in similar situations and they ask me, um, sorry, take your time. I always remind my kids that I have a dream for them, right? That I have a plan for them. It's not about dictating their lives or like telling them what to do. <clears throat> but I think it would have been very valuable to me and helped me get a lot further faster if there was someone in my life who had a vision for me, right? Because I was just winging it the whole time, having to do everything on my own. And so with my own kids, I'm constantly reminding them that I have dreams for you. I have expectations for you. And that's what's different about my parenting. And also, whatever their dreams are, like for my oldest son, for example, is a hell of a baseball player. And he wants to be in the MLB. And I don't have a plan B for my kid's dream. My younger son wants to be a professional mountain biker. And I don't tell him to have a plan B about that either. And so everything we do around their dreams is under the expectation that they will succeed at them. And rather than being a parent who's going to tell you, well, that's it. That's great, honey. But you should also have a plan B. Or you should also think about a backup. We just don't have that in our family. Everything is about whatever your dream is. That's what you're going to do. And that's what we're going to support you. But I think it starts with making sure my kids know that I also have dreams for them. I have expectations for them. And I'm a partner uh, with them in that growth. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, my last question, I'm a big fan of gratitude, especially expressing gratitude to peers, contemporaries, mentors who've helped you along the way. You mentioned uh, David McLean, I think you said was one that you'd want to shout out. Who would you want to shout out and thank for helping you along the way? Yeah, there's another member of EO named Dave Bacon. <clears throat> and when I, uh, this is not emotional now, I'm just congested. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think Dave would like it if I was emotional. Um, when, I, when, I first, uh, when I first joined um, the Accelerator program, this was like almost 11 years ago now, Dave was a huge figurehead in the EO community. Like he was, he's just such a big personality and a great guy. And I always saw him from afar. And I became very like aspirational to, to play at the level that these guys were playing and to be as successful as these guys were being. But I had a lot of fear, you know, and I certainly had a lot of, I would say, real self-esteem issues. You know, I knew that my background was a lot different than other people. And I hated, to, I actually hated to say that I'd never graduated from high school. And I was very embarrassed about a lot of the things that had happened to me, which I have now come to see as, you know, strengths and great catalysts to my success. <clears throat> but Dave, Dave Bacon uh, uh, did a mixed form with me and he never, he never, uh, he kind of never let me forget what my dreams were. And he became somebody who was willing to befriend me and always make me feel comfortable in EO, introduce me to other people. And so rather than having this feeling that I wasn't one of them, this guy really worked hard to make sure that I understood that I was and gave me a level of confidence to ask questions I probably wouldn't have asked, to take chances I wouldn't have taken, and to just really be a part of a community and really believe I am an entrepreneur. And that was really powerful. Mm, that's great. Uh, Travis, thank you so much for your time and for being so transparent, open, and sharing your stories. Um, where can people go to check you out, learn more about you? I think probably just go to travisluther.com. And from there, you can see all my social networks, including LinkedIn and uh, my blog and, and uh, different businesses that I've worked on and things that I'm working on now. And Lawfather and Trial Line are the names of the uh, other businesses. Uh, Travis, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution Podcast with John Corcoran. 
Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast.